Our next presenter, Dimitri Becker of Johns Hopkins University Applied Physics Laboratory. He will be talking to us about architecture for software assisted hardware accelerated image processing, reflections from Dart and Dragonfly. Dimitri. All right, um, I'm assuming everyone can hear me. So um, thank you for joining me for this talk. Uh, my name is Dimitri Becker. And uh, yeah, this will be about hardware accelerated image processing, uh, specifically our implementations and architectures from Dart and Dragonfly. So I, I lead the onboard vision processing implementation for, for both projects. And we have a small but very focused and dedicated team uh, working on these designs um, consisting of Raoul Smith, Ming Kwan Tran, and John Yusuf. Next slide. So two exciting missions, um, Dart, uh, DART is the uh, double asteroid redirection test. This is NASA's first planetary defense mission. And this mission uses a single camera instrument uh, called DRACO. Uh, this instrument will uh, uh, image um, as we are guiding the spacecraft to impact with um, uh, an asteroid, Dimorphos. Uh, Dimorphos is the smaller of two asteroids in the binary Didymo system. So the point here is basically to test uh, kinetic deflection technology, uh, kinetic deflection mission design, uh, should the need ever arise in the future to, for real, uh, defend Earth from incoming asteroids, we'd have a better idea of how to um, design uh, the right spacecraft and the right kinetic deflection uh, for, for this project. Uh, so this is just a test. Uh, this asteroid is not coming uh, uh, to, uh, to Earth. Uh, but we'll be able to observe the impact from Earth and, and see how, um, how it uh, changed uh, um, the, uh, the orbit of the secondary asteroid. So this, this is pretty late in development already. Uh, launch is scheduled for later this year. And the next mission that I will also talk about here is Dragonfly. Uh, if you have dialed in on, on Monday, you heard um, Brandon Haber uh, talk about Dragonfly. So this is a rotorcraft lander mission uh, to Titan. Uh, Titan is uh, the moon of Saturn. Uh, there, we will explore the dunes of Titan autonomously with only uh, waypointing provided uh, from the ground. These are you know, high level instructions of, of where we need to fly, but everything else will happen completely on board uh, autonomously. Uh, we carry uh, various instruments that will sample materials and determine surface composition, basically characterizing the habitability of Titan's environment. Uh, and the launch for this mission is in 2027 with a slated arrival in the mid 2030s. So it's a, it's a very long long duration mission. Next slide. So what do these two have in common for from the image processing perspective? Well, they both have to do something at one hertz, right? We're, we're processing data at this uh, uh, one frame per second cadence. For DART, uh, we have to do something called a connected component analysis to find centroids of connected pixels. So when we're looking for these two asteroids, um, we're basically trying to find out where's the center of those um, of the, those asteroids so we can feed it upstream to our smart nav algorithms uh, and GNC algorithms that they can then fly the spacecraft and, and impact uh, to the center. Um, we also do more routine image processing tasks like calibrations, uh, windowing, and, and binning of the data as it's received from the detector. Uh, we also do hardware packetization as well. So this is executed on an FPGA. Uh, and that uh, is a really unique uh, feature of the design where we are actually able to stream uh, image data that's properly packetized directly to the radio with no main flight software involvement. It's just going straight straight to our radio pipe. For Dragonfly, uh, also a one hertz cadence, there the problem is different. Uh, here we are uh, using two different techniques to uh, autonomously uh, fly on the, on the, uh, in the skies of, of Titan. So one is uh, terrain relative navigation. Here we use image to image face correlation, basically comparing two images, uh, consecutive images, to see how far we have gone uh, from one to the other, basically looking at shifts in, in, in the coordinates. Um, and that helps to keep the rotorcraft flying uh, to the flight plan waypoints. Uh, when it comes time to land, and we do land a lot, because every time we go to fly, we have to come back and land, uh, for landing, we, we use LiDAR, and there we process uh, the LiDAR data to build safe landing maps for hazard-free landing. Um, in both of these cases, we have to save imagery, we have to save the LiDAR data, we have to feed our um, onboard processing solutions up to flight software and GNC uh, so they can navigate uh, the spacecraft. And again, also for Dragonfly, there's various 
the tr more traditional image processing techniques that get applied to just calibration, distortion correction, and, and warping and filtering. Next slide. Okay, so that's kind of like a high overview of what the two missions do. Uh, so let's let's dive into DART. Um, so here, here's the image processing pipeline for DART. So as I mentioned before, we, we do things like windowing and binning, calibration, buffering. Uh, these are all more or less traditional image processing approaches that, that you do for, for many missions that, that have a detector on board. Um, but the really interesting part that's happening here is this connected component analysis algorithm uh, consisting of thresholding, blobbing, and centroiding. Um, so if you can click on that video on the right, um, so this is a simulation from early on in the development uh, of the project. And, and this just helps to demonstrate what, what we're going after. So we have these two asteroids. I mean, this is obviously when we're pretty close up, but we have these two asteroids in view and the space search will have to autonomously maneuver itself and focus on that smaller of the two and try to aim and hit in the center. So in order to do that, this first step of the image processing is this uh, CCA algorithm. And we have a reference uh, down, down here uh, in the bottom of the slide. But basically, if you have five objects, as is shown in the image on the left there, you'll be able to get these five bounding boxes with the centers identified. Now, this, this particular algorithm that we've selected uh, from this paper implementation is very unique in that it can do this processing in a single path, pass. So traditionally, you need multiple passes to first identify these blobs and then come back and figure out which pixels are connected to which blobs. But in this case, this is well suited for real-time implementation, so you can do this all in one pass. Uh, and interestingly, you can even throw very complex uh, image patterns to this algorithm. For example, like the picture shown in the middle there, uh, if you're trying to do like a scan of this image, you know, from, from top down, you don't really know that those uh, components are connected until you get uh, to the last row of that last pixel uh, for those bottom three uh, components. Then you really can figure out that they are connected. So this algorithm can handle that. Not that we're gonna see asteroids of the shape, but it's very robust uh, to, to these types of patterns. Next slide. Uh, one more. Okay, so for Dragonfly, and uh, I have to say this is this is a very elaborate uh, diagram um, slash video, and I have to give credit to our TRM TRN algorithms team for putting this together. Uh, if you can please uh, play the video. Okay, so for terrain relative navigation for for Dragonfly, basically what we're doing here uh, is what's known as uh, image to image phase correlation. When you look at two images, when you're flying, they're gonna be shifted a little bit, right? Um, so it's like looking at two signals. If they're shifted a little bit, if you do uh, an FFT on them, you can find out the phase difference. From the phase difference, you can find out how big the shift is. So that's what we're doing with imagery for Dragonfly. We're finding out how, how big this shift is between the two images so that we can uh, identify the coordinate shift uh, between, between those images. It's essentially flying by dead reckoning uh, because we don't have a GPS uh, to bring with us on Titan. Um, there's one interesting piece of this design in that occasionally we use what is known as a breadcrumb. And a breadcrumb is a special image that we have identified uh, previously that we know is a very good image. It has a lot of good features and that we know that if we have a good match of that image, then we can reduce our arrow, error in our flight path. So occasionally we compare to these special breadcrumb images. But the processing is the same, uh, any, uh, regardless. We're, we're running these uh, two-dimensional FFTs to try to figure out the, uh, the phase correlation between the images. Uh, and this is a very computationally intensive task, and that'll be important later on. Uh, next slide. Uh, we also do uh, LiDAR processing. Um, so LiDAR kicks in uh, when we're close to, uh, to our landing. Uh, if you can please play this video. So for LiDAR, as we are uh, flying over the surface, we have to build these um, uh, uh, maps, uh, deviation maps, slope maps, and hazard distance maps uh, in order to inform the, the flight software of where the safe landing sites are. So this is a very computationally intensive process, and it's best suited uh, to be broken up into both some parts being done in, in hardware design in the FPGA and some, some being done uh, in embedded processors. So the first two, two portions here, the, this is the back projection and building the elevation maps. That's best done in FPGA logic. That's a very image processing um, heavy application. And uh, building of deviation maps, slope maps, and hazard distance, it's, it's better suited for an embedded processor. And we include that in our design uh, to help compute the, uh, the hazard distance map. 
And this is all happening outside of the main flight software, offloading the main flight software uh, so it's able to run you know, traditional things and other things that, that we need during the mission, such as GNC, autonomy, uh, uh, command and control, things like that. Uh, next slide. Okay, so that was kind of all the background of what we're trying to do. And you know, all of that was, uh, we knew all of that in the beginning uh, of these projects as we embarked on figuring out how we, are, how we would implement this. So taking a step back, how do you actually do this, right? So naively, we, you know, we'd like to do all this in software. Um, software is uh, uh, much, much quicker development cycles. Um, you know, compile times are much shorter, easier to test, uh, a lot of developers available. Uh, but these are computationally intensive tasks. So we have to take a step back and really, the first thing that needs to be done is we need to evaluate the performance of these key kernels. Can we actually do this on board with the hardware that we're planning on designing and building for these missions? So for Dart, uh, we, we are flying a UT700 uh, 100 megahertz processor. And prior to embarking on developing the CCA algorithm implementation, we did some benchmarking to see how well it would hold up on that processor. Uh, we actually tested in the 50 megahertz, which was what was available on development systems at the time. Um, and we found out that it was going to be pretty heavy. So it was going to consume almost a second running at 50 megahertz. And that was without doing any other parts of the traditional flight software that is still needed for, for the mission. So that was, that was a no-go. Um, so definitely for that, we needed some sort of an accelerator. And, and for that, we chose an RTG4 FPGA um, uh, with assistance from an embedded soft core Liam to help us run that connected component analysis. Uh, for Dragonfly, the problem was even more, um, you know, higher magnitude uh, of uh, computational performance needed there. Um, one of just just one part of, of that processing, you know, forget about LiDAR for a second, but just doing the phase correlation for TRN, uh, one key step is doing these two dimensional FFTs. Uh, just doing those two-dimensional FFTs on a RAD 750-like processor that we experimented with in the beginning of the project would take four seconds. Um, so that you know that was that was a no-go too because we were trying to hit this one hertz rate. Uh, again, that helped inform our decision to to move towards an FPGA-based implementation for these heavy image processing applications. Next slide, please. Okay, so now that you know. That you can't really do it all in software. You know where do you start? So you gotta you gotta kind of you know you gotta think like a computer. You gotta know your hardware and your software. So if if, if you're trying to implement something in software, you know you got fast development cycles. It's easy to compile and deploy. Um, but if you're the CPU, you know you have to you know you have to execute instructions. You gotta read those instructions from memory or from cache. Um, you gotta move data around. There's traffic to from memory. There's contention on the bus. Everything is coming through this one pipe, right? So there are some downsides in, in doing any sort of efficient data manipulation if you're running on a CPU uh, with a very huge upside in that it's much more straightforward and the development cycle is, is much, much quicker. But uh, realistically, it's not optimal for most image processing kernels, but it's great for stitching together complex sequences of operations. Now, if you're trying to do this in an FPGA and hardware, you're fighting slower development cycles, long compile times, and the ease or difficulty of deploying this uh, on a board, on a target board, is really coupled to the maturity of that board. So if you're at the same time developing your spacecraft avionics and you're also targeting that FPGA for some of these algorithms, you know, you're, you're also gonna be finding out various bugs and you know, things that you normally find uh, with new hardware. So it's a little bit uh, more, more involved there. Um, but on the upside is you can build these optimal processing pipelines. You can stitch together math operations that execute at high throughput. You can avoid sharing cluttered system buses and really, really uh, do this parallel processing well. Um, and it's honestly the most optimal implementation for streaming applications, but it can be difficult to stitch together complex sequences. So for that latter part, for the stitching together of complex sequences, we, um, we like to put in these embedded soft core processors to help, you know, to help manage this, this beast of a firmware implementation and abstract it away from the rest of the flight software system. Next slide. Okay, so Dart, um, again, pretty, uh, you know, we're pretty much done with the development and implementation for Dart, the spacecraft is going into TVEC. Um, it's a tightly coupled hardware software design. And as I mentioned, our FPGA logic is performing uh, the core image processing functions, calibration, windowing, and binning, 
the CCA analysis and also doing hardware packetization so we can feed uh, the radio directly without any uh, flight software involvement. This was necessary to do this sort of design because we had a requirement to be able to image the surface with a certain resolution for impact, right? Because you know there's only a certain amount of time before we hit and while we can still broadcast the images. And, and in order to meet that time, we, we had to do this in the hardware. Um, it was also very important to include the embedded Leon uh, software processor early on so that it can help manage this pipeline and abstract the data calls uh, from, from the main flight software. Uh, next slide, please. And so he, here's what I mean. So the embedded Leon processor on Dart, uh, this is all that it's doing. Everything fits into one slide. Uh, it's implemented within, I think, 43 kilobytes or so. Uh, we have no operating system. It's running bare C with some assembly in places. And it's doing, you know, the few things that it has to do, it's doing them very well. It's got a couple different commands. It's running through a big loop executive and it's uh, paying attention to uh, what our spacecraft flight software is asking it to do, whatever mode it's asking it to run at. And in that mode, it's going, going around in a big loop and checking various registers, responding to interrupts and things like that. So very low overhead, very efficient, uh, and a very good way, I would say, to abstract all of the difficulties of interfacing with custom FPGA solutions uh, with the rest of your flight software system. So this is kind of our, like our bridge. Uh, it really helps to, to uh, uh, make the ICD sort of um, uh, very straightforward. Next slide. Uh, memory. So in addition to processors and FPGAs, when you're developing these algorithms for image processing, you have to think about memory. And the best case, the best example I have of this is from Dragonfly. So when you're doing these two-dimensional FFTs, uh, if you just think about the memory access pattern, um, it is what I have shown here on the lower right. You have to do first FFTs in one direction across rows of memory, and then you have to do it in another direction across columns. So when you're doing it across rows, this is all good. Uh, SDRAM memory and SRAM memory do very well for that. When you're specifically for SDRAM, when you're asking to fetch a single word, you get many words coming out of that memory as a burst. But when you're trying to access that same memory as column access, you know I'm asking for one piece of data, A11, and the memory will return to me A11, A12, A13, but I don't care about those other two. I want A11, A21, A31, right? I wanna go down. So that actually gives you, there's actually a big penalty there for, for accessing SDRAM memory, not the most optimal memory then for doing two dimensional FFTs. So these are the types of things that you have to come to early in the design so that you can form uh, the board designer um, and that you can sync up your algorithm to make sure that it's, it's going to be implemented uh, efficiently. Uh, so that's what we did early on in the, pro in the program and selected the, the memory types that would be most suitable for, for this algorithm. And if you can see in the, in the picture that I have here, basically uh, the pattern here is a bunch of streaming from one bank to the other. And we're really trying to minimize any downtime in the processing and going between those banks. Next slide. So this is kind of a high level overview of the, um, of the uh, TRN processing for Dragonfly. Again, you see a lot of memory thrown around in different places, uh, but basically, as I mentioned in the previous slide, we're trying to stream uh, between different banks uh, in order not to, um, you know, not to keep uh, bogged down uh, in, in reading and writing from a single bank. And that really helps us uh, to keep up with the processing uh, and, and make building a very efficient pipeline. I would say that we have no inherent memory bottlenecks for this particular implementation, which is based on a 32-bit bus. Obviously, if we had an even wider bus, we can do more, but, you know, let's, let's be reasonable. We're, you know, the wider that we have, the more uh, the more push that we will have to do on the hardware avionics to support this. So 32 is, is reasonable. And in this architecture, we're basically operating as fast as the memory um, and the uh, FPGA frequencies can sustain. We're not, there's no downtime in between these different cores. Next slide. Uh, another thing that we did early on in the project that I, that I, that I thought was very important and uh, I, I will be doing in, in, in future projects as well is uh, we knew that we had to include an FPGA in this design to help us with the image processing, but we really had to convince ourselves and we had to convince NASA as well uh, that everything would fit. So early on in the project, we tallied up all of the functions that we had to do. We either 
ran pieces of it on development hardware, or we even compiled and synthesized certain pieces of that code and basically got an idea of the resource utilization and the expected performance. Uh, those numbers were very variable uh, in, in phase A of the project. Uh, obviously, you know, we're further along in development now, now so this happens uh, in, in most, most uh, engineering development projects. We, uh, you know, our utilization has grown and our, and our processing rates have decreased, but uh, that is mainly a function of uh, additional tasking that we're asked uh, being asked to do on the image processing side. For example, additional filtering or additional distortion uh, that wasn't uh, evident uh, in the beginning of the project. But this gave us a good baseline and it really um, helped to solidify uh, the, um, uh, the, 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 implement, the planned implementation even at the proposal stages. Next slide. Okay, um, I wanna mention the importance of testing. So especially for these uh, long uh, duration image processing uh, runs, you have to test on hardware. It's not enough just to do simulations. You can't just think about of a, from, of a corner case and simulate that one or two particular images that exercise that corner case. You have to run your tests over many frames, over hours, and you know, how else are you gonna catch the occasional, you know, a packet lost 20 minutes into your test, right? It's gonna be hard to, to catch that if you're just simulating one or two image frames that you know, are difficult for the computation to keep up with. Uh, there could be other system level considerations that, would, that can cause you to miss a beat. And the only way to find this out is by, is by running testing on the hardware. And to sustain that testing, uh, we had to build our own verification tools. So we, we built software tools that, uh, that log both the, the input data coming in, the output data coming out, the expected values, and we can automatically um, uh, compare the known good results versus what our hardware is putting out. And this is all this is all bench level testing even before we get to integration with the rest of the subsystems in the design. Next slide. Uh, okay, so here are some uh, recent results from Dart. Um, if maybe we just go to the middle of that video. Um, so yeah, not to the middle or so. So uh, this this was great to see. I mean, this this was basically our FPGA slash embedded software uh, implementation uh, running uh, together with the flight software, together with the GNC, with the, with the whole system put together, simulators feeding simulated data, the test beds are connected to the system to, to represent the simulated environment of flying. So all of this hardware was exercised and uh, from simulation to simulation, uh, we were able to, uh, to hit, hit the asteroid. So we felt pretty good that it, it's gonna work uh, for real. Um, all right, one minute left, Dimitri. It will hit. Yeah, okay, so next slide. I think I have a few more. I'll try to wrap it up quickly. So this is from Dragonfly. Um, on the left there, uh, we have demonstrated that our face correlation is working in simulated data. Uh, of course, there's more updates to the algorithm to be done. And if you click play on that middle video, uh, we've also been flying our, our half-scale um, quadcopter uh, implementation, octocopter technically. Um, and recording real data from the camera. So the next steps immediately for Dragonfly for this test platform is to demonstrate what we have on the left running on simulated data uh, to run it with uh, image data collected in flight uh, with, the, uh, with the octocopter. And that will be happening in the next few months or so. Uh, next slide. So key takeaways, you gotta know your system. Um, you gotta understand what function the embedded system must execute and you need to know the you know where hardware and software both excel. Some things are going to be easy in hardware, some are easy in software. Uh, if you know both of those, um, you can help steer the decision so that it's not painful in one or the other. Um, so it's very important to talk to all of these different subsystems as you're developing, talking both to the avionics folks that are building the boards, the flight software folks that are building flight software, and our algorithms folks that are. Uh, that have these ideas of, of how, you know, how the algorithm need to function. Uh, next slide. I think this is my last one. Um, yeah, the hardware software line is pretty blurred these days. Um, you have to know your algorithm complexity. As I mentioned, some things are hard in hardware. Some things are impossible. Uh, some things are very easy. So just keep that, keep in mind, keep that in mind and, um, you know, talk to your friendly uh, FPGA slash embedded software engineer to get an idea of, of the best best split between uh, 
uh, between these uh, applications. Thank you. I'll take questions on Slack. I think I'm out of time. All right. Yes. Thank you very much, Dimitri. Very uh, good, interesting presentation. We do have a few questions. And so let's take those over to Slack. Absolutely.